Okay, so I think this year Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded, uh, as you know, to Alan Spage and Kozov and Anthony Zanninger for um, experiments. Um, oh, sorry, the, the, the keyboard is working. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. No, it's a problem. Okay, it's working. Okay, for experiments establishing the violation of uh, bell inequalities. Okay, the violation of bell inequalities. This is um, a topic in the the foundation of quantum physics. It's um, one of the most, if not the most important result in the foundation of physics. And in a nutshell, what it tells us is that um, in trying to understand quantum theory. We must necessarily uh, abandon some classical, maybe naive notions uh, of causality. And this would be true even if someday uh, in the future quantum theory is replaced by another theory. So there is no way back to some classical description of reality. And in, in the default statement, um, the non Bell Committee said that another reason to award the Bell Prize is pioneering quantum information. And, and by the way, this is the first time that the, world, uh, the words quantum information appear in the reason for a Nobel Prize. And indeed, it makes uh, sense to relate uh, Bell inequalities to quantum information. Uh, as I said, Bell inequalities show that um, quantum theory must differ in some deep ways from um, any classical theory. And the, the field where this departure from classicality is most manifest is certainly quantum information, where Quantum effects like entanglement, superposition, the sort of principle are exploited to conceive new ways to process and communicate information, which are impossible in the classical world. And on the experimental side, quantum information require a manipulating entangled state um, of individual particles. And the experiment by Aspect, Loser, and Zeilinger were among the first uh, to achieve that. So there is clearly some kind of logical or historical link from Bell inequalities to quantum information. But today we are um, 60 years uh, after the discovery, and we are at a time where we fully embrace uh, quantum theory. And on the theory side, people keep discovering uh, new ways um, by which quantum information differ from classical information. And on the experimental side, people are uh, doing experiment with dozens or hundreds of entangled particles or experiment much more complex than the one achieved by those of us design group. And so maybe today we can ask a question, are the inequality still relevant? Um, I mean, do they represent only some historical milestone, some result of the past, or is it still a topic which is uh, important today? And uh, do quantum engineers that build these quantum devices need to know about the inequalities? And if you had asked this question to Ben, uh, he would have probably answered no, they do not need to know. The inequalities. So this is a quotation from Ben. So uh, one day he opened a talk by saying, uh, I'm a quantum engineer, but on Sundays I have principles. So what, what did he mean by that? So John Bell was a high energy uh, theorist working at seven. He was working on neutrino experiments and other experiments they were doing. And um, what he mean by I'm a quantum engineer is that in his daily job as a physicist at seven, he was learning using applying quantum theory. And by but on Sunday, like the principles, he meant that his work on the interpretation of quantum theory that uh, led to these inequalities, this is something he did uh, on the side as a hobby during the evenings or the weekends. And colleagues of Bell and people who know him uh, remember that he was himself saying that uh, his work on Bell inequalities did not make any difference to people who wanted Murray to use and you know, apply quantum theory. So what I want to tell you in this talk today is that um, no, this has changed. Okay, since um, about ten or uh, fifteen years, uh, it was realized that Bell inequalities are not only a foundational topic, but they also have applications in quantum information. And the, the reason is that they are at the core of uh, device-independent quantum information. So, so, so what is that? This is uh, an approach um, where quantum information protocols can be uh, designed in such a way that it's possible uh, to verify, to certify that they are uh, correctly uh, implemented. And, and this certification can be obtained without trusting at all the physical implementation of the quantum devices, which are used to build the protocol. So the quantum devices, they're seen as some black boxes. There is something happening inside, we don't know what, uh, but they take some you know, classical data as an input, 
they process it, they put some classical data, and only by doing some statistical tests on the data that is being generated, we can verify that the devices uh, operate correctly, and we can verify that the full protocol they implement is correctly uh, implemented. So I'm going to try to explain um, uh, what is this the I, uh, device independent point information approach and what is the link with balance inequalities. But first, let me tell you a little bit why do we care important information about characterizing or certifying quantum devices. So um, maybe the, the main lessons, the main lesson from, from quantum information is that uh, physics matter for information processing. So storing a bit in a two-level classical system is not the same as storing a bit in a two-level quantum system. Uh, and so if you use this qubit, you can do uh, new kind of uh, applications. So you can have um, quantum random number generators that allow to produce numbers that are truly unpredictable. You can have quantum cryptographic systems like quantum distributions that allow two users to share a secret key that they can use to encrypt communication. And the security of these schemes only relies on the laws of quantum physics, while the security of the schemes that we have today rely on um, unproven computational assumptions on the adversary. Um, maybe sometime in the future, you could also have quantum simulators and quantum computers, which will allow you to um, efficiently compute uh, property of many body systems in physics or chemistry. And we should even use to uh, solve problems that are seemingly unrelated to quantum mechanics, like factoring large numbers, which is a very hard problem for um, classical computers. Okay, and so this picture uh, I put in this slide are pictures that come from uh, real companies that either uh, already sell these quantum technologies. So this is the case for uh, quantum random number generator and quantum distribution. So you can already buy this kind of device, or a company that plan to sell this device sometime in the future. So this is the case for quantum simulator and quantum computers. Now, when you build or when you buy uh, one of these devices, you would like to know if they uh, work correctly, if they produce the right answer. And um, as you can see uh, on this picture, all these devices are black boxes. So they are literally uh, black, but it's also convenient to view them as black boxes from a, a functional perspective. So you get one of these devices, you don't really know what's happening inside, you get some outputs, and based on that output, you'd like to know if um, the implementation was correct. Okay? And if we think about most of the devices that we use in our daily life, this is quite um, easy to test them from a black box perspective. So for instance, my iPhone, uh, it's also a black box, also literally, and you know, its main function is to make calls mm -hmm. and I can easily test if it's working, if I hear my correspondent, and if he hears me, I know everything is fine. But with this phone information device, this is not so easy to do. And let me uh, explain that by looking first at the simplest case, which is uh, randomness generation. So this is um, sorry, what's happening? It's working again. Okay, this is a, a cartoon that maybe yeah. some of you already know. So over here we have a random number generator nine 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 nine. Are you sure that's random? That's a prime randomness you can never be sure. So this is a joke, but there is some some truth to it. Mm -hmm. So suppose you buy. Um, so then the keyboards are working. You can even use the mouse. So suppose you buy one of these fancy uh, random generator, you use it, and then you get this screen as an output. Now, based on that output, you'd like to know um, if you know the what you get is are truly random numbers. So, so what could happen? There are different possibilities. You know, it could be that this screen was generated one in advance and then stored inside the device. Then the device just output it. Or it could be that here inside there is a, a pseudo random number generator, so a mathematical algorithm that produce uh, in a completely deterministic way data that only looks random. Or it could be that maybe there is some classical noise which is used to produce numbers like electromagnetic noise and someone could uh, influence the environment of the device, maybe could influence the output. Or it could be that it's, there is indeed a truly run quantum process that generates the string. And just by looking at the output, you cannot distinguish all these possibilities. Um, and the reason is that when you use um, the generator, um, you don't really care about the particular output that you get. What you care is that before uh, using the device, so, so before pushing the button, 
um, you tell that all possible strings are equally like. Okay, but when, once you use the device, there is only one of these possibility that materializes, and 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 this this doesn't tell you anything about the other possibilities that didn't materialize. Okay, so what you require is not really the output but, but the process, and and to uh, verify that the process uh, is a true quantum one, you have um, to open the box. You have to look what is inside, and maybe you find that there is some uh, components that uh, produce your photon in a quantum state, which is measured, and then you need to go the process. Okay, so physics gives us some new way to predict randomness. Then the other side of the coin is that to check that uh, this device works properly, we have to look at the physical environment. So maybe you tell me, okay, this is true, but this is really particular to randomness generation because the output of a random number generator has no structure. But if we look at the other application of quantum information, like quantum computer, it should be, be different because the output. Excuse me, yeah. can I ask one question yeah, about the previous topic? Yeah, yeah. So, if, uh, in the case of quantum mm -hmm. device, mm -hmm. is this uh, uh, number of, mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. generating mm -hmm. random values really infinite? Because in classical uh, quant uh, classical random generator, you always have a period of order of ten to nine or something like that. Yeah, in absolute solar energy, we have some period. Yes. It's true. Um, in that case, you, it, yeah, in you principle, you wouldn't have it. you wouldn't see the, you have the spirit of effect in principle. Oh. Okay. Okay. So maybe tell me. Okay, maybe you know this fact that you you, uh, you cannot check uh, the device from the output uh, wouldn't happen with the final computer because there. Have to output um, an answer which has a, a given structure. It must be the answer to some question, and you can check that, right? And this is true in some cases. So, for instance, uh, if you use your quantum computer to factor a large number, so you take some very large uh, integer, you give it as an input to quantum computer, and then it can give you two uh, numbers which are factors of it, and you can check this is the case simply by taking these two numbers, you can multiply them. You can do that very efficiently on a test of computer, and then you can check that indeed it's, it's the right answer. Okay, so you, you don't care really how the, com the computer managed to do this. It doesn't matter. You can check that the answer is correct, and this is what what you care about. Okay, so this is true in this case. But this is because uh, factoring is uh, an anti problem. Okay, so you know that um, computer scientists they classify. Um, computational problem in uh, complexity classes. So we have the class P, problems which you can solve efficiently on a classical computer. We have the class MP, problems that you can solve, that whose answer we can check efficiently on a classical computer. Uh, you have this famous problem whether P is equal to P. Um, and then we have the class P, the class of problems that a quantum computer can solve uh, efficiently. And in factoring, here, this here with the diagram. So it's both in B2P and in B2P. So you can solve it efficiently on a quantum computer. You can verify the answer efficiently on a classical computer. But as you see, uh, the class B2P is not fully contained in NP. Okay? So there are certain problems here that you can solve efficiently with a quantum computer, but whose answer you cannot verify efficiently with a classical computer. And, and one example is the, the Taylor pattern problem. So what is this problem? You're given uh, an Hamiltonian on n qubit. And this Hamiltonian is a sum of terms where each term acts at the most k qubits. Okay, so only interaction among k qubits is at most. So you give to the computer a description of that Hamiltonian, and uh, its aim is to compute the brain state energy. Okay, so it outputs some number. So given that number, how do you know it's the correct brain state energy? There is no, no, no way to know that, okay? So this is a problem that is here. But you, if you've got also an eigenvector, that is really better. It's better, but still. Yeah. Could be there is another eigenvector even below it, okay? So um, and the most um, interesting problem that quantum computers will solve, uh, like in many body physics or chemistry, they are uh, in the same situation, okay? So easy to solve with a quantum computer, but not easy to verify the answer with the classical computer. So, how can you um, trust? So, yeah. so, 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 just a point, because as far as I understand, this specific problem that you mentioned is not formally outside NP. So, so people expect 
right? People expect this uh, program is of second thing. Yeah, but it's not like it might be that there's some. It might be some case. This is, this, these are uh, conjectures, right? We, we don't know if yeah. and this different than P or if it exists, but this is what uh, your scientists can um, yeah. think it is the correct picture, okay? Um, and there are deep, I guess, reasons uh, really that this picture, okay? But um, as far as we know, this is uh, the picture. So, how, how can you check the answer is correct? Well, you have to trust the quantum computer. And if you don't trust the quantum computer, then you have to, you know, open the black box and look what is happening inside. And you have to characterize the mm -hmm. sequence of unitary gates, characterize the error, the interaction with the environment, and so on. But this is not uh, easy. Uh, think, for instance, uh, about, you know, this uh, uh, thing that Google made a few years ago where they claim to have achieved uh, quantum supremacy. So to have built a quantum processor that ran a task that you could not run on the best classical computers. So how do we know that the output of that computation was the right one and was not garbage? Okay, we cannot compare the classical simulation because by definition, we cannot simulate this kind of thing. So um, we basically have to trust that the physics of the device is, is correct. And if you look at the, the paper Google published in Nature, there is a supplementary information, which is about 17, uh, 70 sorry, pages long. And most of these uh, 70 pages they try to convince people that the implementation is correct, that you know the, uh, the fidelity of the gates is high enough, that the error is under control, that if you test the device on, on small circuit, that will scale properly, and so on. So it's, not, it's really not uh, an easy task. So this problem that you have to trust the implementation, it's even works for um, quantum cryptography. And for instance, for quantum key distribution. So in quantum key distribution, you have two parties. So Alexia and, and Boris want to exchange, exchange some uh, secret keys. So I hope you know these guys. I didn't know them. I, I looked in Google for a famous uh, Polish people called Alexia and, and Boris. Um, this is what I got, okay. Um, so Alexia, um, and Boris want to establish a secret key. So how they do that, Alicia generates locally uh, some key, and then she encodes it in quantum systems uh, in some way using a quantum device, maybe the polarization of some of the photons. Mm -hmm. so she, she sends a photon to a public channel to Boris. Boris measures them in some particular way, they code uh, the key. Um, and, uh, and then maybe you know there is some is dropper that is um, Monitoring the public channel, so it is uh, Eva, it is Robert, and she's trying to, 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 to get some information about the key. So the point is that um, this action of Robert will introduce uh, errors in the uh, output of box. The reason is that in quantum mechanics, when you make a measurement in the system, this disturbs the system. Okay, so. By, by looking at the error rate that Boris has in the signal, you can infer what's happening on the public channel and whether Eva is present or what kind of information she gets about it. So the, the, the security here in quantum distribution, it follows from the um, observed statistics. Um, about the, it follows from the output produced by the devices. But the data that is produced by the devices, it's not uh, special uh, per se. So if you take some black box perspective, um, there are many ways in which you could reproduce the same data as in the ideal protocol and pass the security test. For instance, you could encode the key in classical systems, or you could encode it uh, in secret photons by but using additional degrees of freedom and polarization, like the frequency of the photons. Um, and if you do that, we'll be able to produce exactly the same data as in the ideal protocol, but the security will be completely lost. And the reason is that to deduce from the error rate something about the action of the uh, each wrapper, you know, you need to know how the key is physically encoded. Okay? Because the amount of error that Eva introduced depends on how the information is physically encoded. So the security follows from the observed statistics. But also from the, um, the physical implementation. Okay, so you have to trust um, the devices that they do some particular thing. And so security proof that people derive in QKD that rely on a theoretical model of the quantum devices. 
uh, but the theoretical model you know, there are abstractions they don't fully represent reality and it may happen that um, an actual implementation deviates from the model used for security and that can open some loophole and this was first shown in 2011 by uh, this guy by mm -hmm. first quad marker what he did in 2011 he took a commercial security system and was able to completely break the security so he was able to get a perfect copy of the key without being detected and this is not in contradiction with the security proof for PKD, because uh, what Makarov exploited is the fact that um, he exploited some feature of, of Boris detector that uh, were not taken, taken into account in the physical model used to prove security. Okay, uh, so then people found a countermeasure to uh, Makarov attack, but then Makarov found another loophole, and this kind of thing has been going on uh, like a mouse and cat game since uh, 2011 and if we type on Google Scholar when hacking we see that every year people find new holes in existing PTB systems so this is really a big weakness of, of QPT. Okay so in summary quantum physics give us new way to build quantum technologies but then you know verifying that this technology work as expected requires us to look at the underlying physics and often this is not very practical or easy to do, especially as some systems are very noisy and you're more and more uh, complex. Um, uh, no. Okay, so then given what I said, it may come as a surprise that you can actually test quantum devices in a fully black box way. Uh, this is what bending qualities allows you to do. And I should stress that if you take a given quantum information protocol, um, usually you cannot test it uh, in a black box way if it has not been designed from the beginning to have this device independent uh, property. Okay, so most protocols that are uh, um, implemented today, like in QKD, for instance, uh, they do not have this device independent property, but you can uh, introduce um, alternative versions of such protocol for which you can do the certification. So how does that work? I'm trying to uh, explain that um, quickly. And the first thing I need to talk about is the spelling inequalities, but you know, I don't want to uh, spend time uh, motivating uh, bending inequalities or the role in foundation quantum physics because this is not the subject of the talk. So I'm going just to do this in, in one slide. Okay. So what uh, Bell's theorem does is that it rules out local hidden variable theories. What are local hidden variable theories? There are some potential uh, alternative theories. That reproduce the prediction of quantum theory, but which have nice classical features like particles as well defined properties. We can measure them without distributing them, all the interactions are local, and so on. Okay. Um, and before getting too excited about the uh, strangeness of quantum theory, it seems reasonable to ask could one of these theory actually replace quantum theory? Okay? It's a reasonable question to consider. And that showed that this was not possible. And that showed that the reason this was not possible was because of um, quantum entanglement. Okay, so the fact that in quantum physics you can have two systems which are in a state like this one, so zero zero plus one one, which you cannot write as a product state, the state of state of one particle times the state of the other particle. What Bell understood it as it is that the, the correlation that you get when you measure such states that cannot be reproduced by local hidden variable theories. And so he conceived, uh, I talked about experiments like this one, where mm. you have a source that maybe produced two particles in this uh, five plus state, so zero, zero plus one, one, one particle goes to the left, one particle goes to the right. The particle on the left is, is measured, so you can have maybe um, two measurements you can do, either A1 or A2. You get some outcome, plus or minus one, you can do the same thing on your side. You choose one of the measurements, V1, V2, you get outcomes. And for instance, you could do that uh, by, uh, you know, A1 could be measuring in the sigma Z basis, A2 in the sigma X basis, and on the other side, the same thing, but maybe with some uh, rotation. Okay. And at the time of Bell, these were thought experiments, but now it's easy to do in the lab. And this is um, the scheme that was used by. Uh, one of uh, Anton Zeilinger experiment in 98. So uh, here, a uh, single photon were used, um, entangled in degree of polarization and so some polarization. 
are done. Okay, so but basically this is what I show here. So now what Bell did is he showed that in such experiments there is a statistical constraint that has to be satisfied by locally invariable theory, and this is what we call Bell inequalities. And um, this is an example of such a Bell inequality. This is an inequality that is due to close of all the the old. So close of is one of this year Nobel laureates. So now we call this the CHSH um, inequality. Uh, so what it, it tells us um, you know, in this experiment, what you can do is you can uh, look at covariates. So you can look at the average value of the product of the uh, measurement outcome on one side um, and the measurement outcome on the other side. Okay, so you, you make some measurement, let's say A1, you get some outcome. You make a measurement, B1, you get some outcome. You multiply the outcome, you repeat many times. You look at the average value, and this gives you this correlator A1B. And there are two measurements on each, on each side. So there are four correlators you can measure A1B1, A1B2, A2B1, A2B2. And then if you look at this linear combination, A1B1 plus A1B2 plus A2B1 minus A2B2, uh, it can be shown that this should always be smaller than two for any locally Okay. But now if you look at the, the quantum prediction, if you use this quantum strategy, so if you know. You produce, produce source produce in tidal state, you do this specific uh, sigma z in a x measurement. Uh, you find that this TTSH value um, is two square root of two, which is above two. And so you have a contradiction. Okay. So this is Bell, Bell's result in, in, in one slide. Okay. So what's the link with what we want to achieve? Um, well, the point is that. Um, on the quantum side, to get this value of square root of two, you should, uh, you know, implement the experiment in a certain way. Okay, so you should produce this entangled state with these measurements, and so in the lab you do that by using your uh, photons, uh, nonlinear crystal, maybe some polarizers, single photon detectors, uh, electro calculators. Okay, so there is a way to implement that uh, in the lab. But when you look at the conclusion you can draw from the results of the experiments, you don't need to make um, you don't need to make any assumptions uh, about how the uh, experiment was implemented. Okay, so so this bound here only depends on the structure of locally variable theory, but not on how the um, the experiment was actually implemented. And and this is clear because, because you know as your the aim. Is to rule out some alternative description than quantum theory. You cannot assume that you know the the things that make sense in quantum theory, like photon polarization, make sense in this alternative theory. Maybe these concepts don't even exist. So you don't want to to, to, to assume them. Okay? So this was the strength of, of Bell, Bell result that it's it holds independently of the, the physical. Uh, Implementation. So this is really a black box statement. Okay. So if you have some black box such that um, so if you have some, some choice of measurement, you get some measurement outcome. You don't know what happened in the boxes, but you assume that um, some LHB model um, reproduces that. You get this bond. Okay. So this is um, getting close to what we want because we also want to have some kind of uh, test. Uh, on devices, which is uh, a black box test. But of, course, of course, the difference is that in quantum information, we don't question quantum theory. We take quantum theory for granted. Okay. So what we want to do is to go beyond there. And instead of assuming local environment model, we want to assume um, quantum theory. Okay. So now we are looking at this experiment in a black box fashion, but assuming the validity of quantum theory. So the source will produce some entangled state, and this could be anything. It could be uh, the fibrous state I showed before. It could be an uh, entangled state of two pure traits, it could be of 100 um, particles, it could be an st entangled state in a space of infinite dimension. It doesn't matter. And then on the left and the right, we assume that when we input mm -hmm. measurement choice, a one or a two, some measurement is done. On that inverse space, which is not specified, doesn't need to be a sigma x or sigma environment. And then using the, the bottom rule, you know, we can relate the correlator to some description of the disks. Yeah. And now, in the same way that Bell or CHSH showed that for LHB theory, 
this bond to follow, we can ask what is the maximal value of CFSH we can get if we have. Um, sorry that I have the, the zoom. Uh, okay, okay, it wasn't good to see the screen, it's fine now. Okay, so we can ask what is the maximal value we can get in value theory? Okay, so um, I showed in the slide, the previous slide, some explicit strategy that reach uh, two scope of two, but could there be some strategy that achieve a better value? So this question was first uh, asked and solved by uh, a mathematician in the 80s called uh, Boris Tirolson. What Boris Tirolson showed is that um, the maximal point of value is two square root of three. Okay, so there is no way to go beyond that bound. Um, so in the case of the CSH, it's quite easy to derive this value, but for general bending quantities, it's 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 really hard. Okay, so you know it's it's a NPR problem, so not not easy to, to compute the, the, this bond. Okay, so um, that's one thing we know about this device. But now uh, another question we can ask is, okay, so we know a specific strategy can you reach the square root of two, which is the one I showed on the previous slide. So if the state here is a fiber state, if the measurement on the left are sigma z, sigma x measurement, if the state measurement on the right are rotated version of these measurements, we know from there we can go to the two square root. Is there some other way to get this value? Maybe there is a, a simpler uh, strategy, easier to implement, but to get the same value. So people have looked for that. And of course, what you can do is you can do some uh, local change of basis, you can change the value. You could uh, embed this two dimensional uh, system in a higher dimensional inverse space simply by adding degrees of freedom, which you don't measure. This will change the value. Uh, so you can do all this kind of trivial transformation, um, which are um, local isometries. So you are mapping that preserve the inner product structure. But what people found out is that besides these trivial local isometries, there is no other way to reach the scope of two than using this strategy. Okay, so these two statements, um, the devices um, are implemented using that strategy. And the device produce a CFC set valuation to scope of two. These are two equivalent statements. Okay. So you know that using that strategy, you can get that CFC value, but you also know that if you start from some black box devices and observe that CFC value, then that strategy is being implemented in the device. Okay. This is what we call uh, self testing the fact that you have some strategy that produces mm -hmm. data, mm -hmm. and that data in turn certify. The strategy implemented is the origin. Okay. And you can also have um, robust self testing. So if the, the CFSH value is not at the maximum, but below, below to scroll to, uh, like, you know, by some delta, you can show that the, the actual strategy is close to the ideal one, and you can measure, quantify this closeness using some of these. Okay. So this is very, very uh, useful statement. And uh, we can use that now to build some device event um, protocols. So the simplest thing we can do is randomness generation. So this is basically just a CHS experiment. So as a user, you get these black boxes, uh, use them many times. Um, you compute the CHS value, and you know that you know if you are close to two square root of two, what is happening is that. Um, this strategy is implemented. So we are doing poly measurement on the one half of an entangled state, but in quantum mechanics, poly measurement on the half of maximum entangled state give completely random outcomes. So you know that you know you should produce uh, randomness and, and you can bond that using that self-testing statement. So you can go, do this kind of computations where um sorry. Where you know, uh, you get this graph where here on the horizontal axis, I put the value on the uh, vertical axis, I put the entropy that's being generated by part per measurement round. Uh, if you get the TFS value of two square root two, the maximum, you can prove that one bit of randomness is generated each time you use a device. If you get some value which is below, you get some uh, entity bound. Uh, but the point is that all the region below 
The curve is not allowed by quantum theory. So for given values of such, there is a minimal amount of entity that is necessarily produced early in the Okay, and so you can use that to certify that some randomness is produced. Um, another thing that you can easily do is quantum distribution because you know uh, if you the two device share entanglements, not only the measurement outcomes are random, but they are also correlated. So you can use that to establish a secret key. So now what you do is that you give one measurement device to Alice, one measurement device to Bob, you put the source in the middle. You don't need to trust at all the devices. And it's in Bob are going to uh, use the device uh, n times. Most of their measurement outcomes are going to keep them secret. They will be used to build the key, but they are going to reveal uh, a subset of their measurement result. To estimate the typical value. Um, and again, if this value is high enough, you know, you can certify that you have entanglement and point measurements and randomness. So the outcome cannot be predicted by some adversary, but also correlation between Alice and Bob. And you can use the self testing results to actually compute uh, the key rate as a function of the error rate uh, in the channel, which uh, and this error rate influences the CFC channel. Okay. So you can also do QQD. You can also do uh, a full-fledged quantum computation. So how does that work? So the standard model of quantum computation that you know, presumably is the circuit model. So where what you have is, you know, an initial state, and then you apply that state, a sequence of unitary one and two gates. So this is a quantum circuit, and this is implementing some quantum computation. But there are alternative models of uh, quantum computation. One alternative model is the teleportation model. Um, so does it work? So here we have uh, teleportation. So you have some qubit in some initial state. Uh, you produce two qubits in the FIPO state, so this maximally entangled two qubit state. You initial qubits, and one half of this maximally entangled state, you measure them by doing some, some bell measurements, so a, a measurement that projects in one of the uh, four uh, maximally entangled two qubit state. And then what happens is that up to some poly error, which you can correct, what you get for the bottom qubit is the initial state. Okay, so, so this state was teleported from that qubit to that qubit. So this is um, teleportation. Um, but now what happens is that if you, instead of using Bell measurement, use a Bell measurement in some rotated basis, what you get is teleportation, but up to some unitary uh, applied here. And you can choose this unitary by choosing the measurement you do. Okay, and so what you have done effectively here, basically, is implement one of these unitary gates. But instead of using the unitary, what you use as a resource is the ability to generate entanglement and to do some joint measurements. And so in a quantum computation, you can replace every unitary by this kind of, of, uh, of diagram. And then you can run a full computation uh, using as a resource only the ability to generate entangled state and doing joint measurements. Okay. So then in the picture, the quantum population is just something where you have uh, two parties, Alice and Bob, that share many entangled states, and then they are doing some joint measurements on, on each part. You know, you would like to certify um, that, you know, the right states are being prepared, the right measurements are being done, uh, if you don't trust you. Computation and the way you can do that is by putting inside this computation at random places some CHSH test. Okay. Um, and also, yeah. I get a bit lost. So, mm -hmm. so I, I know this gets a situation that you present in the previous slide, but you don't have this, uh, that the situation that we would have division between Alice and Bob because you have many, many other systems. So, so why no, no. do you? No, you, 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 you can. Put it like this if you want, right? Okay. Because I mean, basically, you know, you, you will, uh, you can always say, you know, okay, you know, uh, I have one particular goes to Alice, mm -hmm. use a measurement, then the particular Bob is being teleported. Now I use, you know, an, another five plus, which I do as in the man hands of Bob. Bob does a joint measurement, and so I get on you know, the side um, the, the system, and then so, okay. so you, you can separate if you want. The computation is two parties, right? right. Excuse uh, me. Uh, can I can yeah. I ask a question? Yes. Uh, but but what about local unitaries? Because this 
This approach does not detect local unitary transformations, which for computation should be important. No? What do you mean by local unitary transformation? I mean, in, in computation, we, we care also for local operations or on individual qubits. No, 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 but this is also which... right? So the point is that an individual unitary, you can simulate it through this teleportation scheme, right? So it's not just two qubits unitary that you can implement that way. It's, okay. it's one qubit and two qubits, okay? Mm -hmm. Actually, what I showed on the slide is just for one qubit. For two qubits, you will need two factor states and joint measurement on four qubits, right? <clears throat> so you can replace both of them by entanglement and, and joint measurements. Okay, maybe. Yes. So I hope this answers the question. Okay, so what you do to check this is that, you know, at some random basis, you put some decision to test. And then you also put some other tests where on one side, it looks like two CGSH tests, but on the other side, you do one of these joint measurements that you want to switch. Okay. And now, um, if you do this um, CGSH testing and you get the value close to the root of two, um, you can certify that here there's some fiber state and this box is implementing sigma X and sigma Z variables. But because the guy here on the right, you know, doesn't know what's happening on the left, uh, he doesn't know whether you know, these, these guys are part of a tissue switch test or one of these uh, more complex tests. And so um, since you're testing um, this on random instances, uh, so if this test pass, it means that with high probability, this one should also be passed. And so it means that you can certify that here, you also share kind of states and you're doing X and Z measurements. Okay. So now, if you know here that you have kind of state and X and Z measurements, basically you know that um, on the other side, you are effectively preparing uh, sigma X and sigma Z eigenstates. So if you add in addition sigma Y eigenstates, you will be able to do the tomography of this box. You don't have sigma Y eigenstates, but what you can show is that there is a set joint measurements. That can be fully characterized tomographically using only sigma X and sigma Z eigenstates, and which are universal for quantum computation. And so, if you use this joint measurement for computation, you are able, uh, because you trust this guy, this guy, to do the tomography of this, this box. And again, um, because this test uh, is random linear computation, if this test is passed, I mean, all, all the joint measurements must be um, implemented correctly. And so, you certify. That's in computation. Okay, so maybe I went a bit quickly, but I hope it's okay for but for us for people know. Yes. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm still mm -hmm. the, kind of confused about the assumptions. So those, some of those bell S mm -hmm. are carried out on the single parity. Mm -hmm. Then the same bell, or is yeah, yeah, yeah. So what you see is that I said bell okay. So you have this division. So when you do something here on the right, like this test, you know this box, you know, to measure. Of I plus used in the okay. stage test or used in one of these more complex tests, and the point is that um, the device cannot treat you uh, if they pass the stage test. Everything must be uh, perfect. Okay, so you can do, you know, uh, you can use self testing to do randomness generation, um, quantity distribution, quantum computation, and basically any quantum information task. So uh, every time pe people found the quantum information protocol that will solve some task, people have been able. To find a device in version. Um, okay, so uh, as I said, this idea of device testing happened uh, around um, 2020, uh, 2010. So, what, what people have been doing since, well, let me tell you uh, very briefly. So, on the theory side, um, people have been able to derive new uh, other self testing results. So I told you that using such state, you can self test the five plus state, sigma X and sigma Z measurement, but actually you can self test any bipartite and state, many bipartite states like rest states, W states. You can um, certify other class of measurements. People have been trying to derive uh, such testing results which are really robust categories. And, and you have here one of the, the world uh, experts in that field, which is uh, Remy Kipogusiak and his student um, Shubai and Sarkar is going to defend his thesis precisely on this subject this afternoon. Um, there also been work on building a device and protocol. So in my talk, you may suggest that it's really easy to translate a self-testing result 
who are via protocol, but this is not uh, the case. So there are many technical details under the rug. So, for instance, one issue that you have to take into account is that when you do this spending equality test, you have some st statistical fluctuations, and this can, uh, you know, mess up the conclusions. So we have to understand how to take that into account. But that's not necessarily easy. Uh, people have also been looking at the mathematical, mathematical structure of collaboration in the experiments to try to get um, device and statement that bypass self testing, and which are often more robust to noise. And the people have shown that you can do that using convex optimization and uh, semi definite programming techniques. And there are links with some deep mathematical results, for instance, by following this line of uh, thinking. Uh, these are people who um, solved this uh, concept and conjecture, which was uh, an old uh, mathematical conjecture on one algebra dating back to the, the 70s. On the experimental side, the first um, DI uh, polyformation experiment was performed in 2010. It was a quantum random number experiment. So this was done using two trapped ion. Um, the experiment runs for one month and a half and was able to generate 42 random bits. Okay, so this is quite slow. Um, the reason trapped ion were used is that to get a proper bell violation, you need to use um, detectors that have a really high efficiency above 80 or 90 percent. Uh, otherwise, you open what is called a detection loophole. And at the time, it was not possible to close the detection loophole with photons. But um, now we can do it. So, uh, Anton Zellinger was on the first one to close the detection loophole with photons. And so, uh, a little bit more than a year ago, people did um, uh, device and then randomness duration experiments using photons and were able to achieve um, about 10 to the 8 random bits in uh, 20 hours. So, quite an improvement. Now you can do this experiment quite easily, but in the lab, it's still not by the device that does this. And the main problem is that you get this very high uh, detector efficiency. You need to put down the detectors at very low temperature. So you need some lab to do that. Yeah. So in the last case, how do they certify that these are random? Sorry? In the last experiment, how do they certify that these are random? Are using some Really? Yeah, yeah. But they did more if I'm did randomness. Expansion. Okay, I want to want to enter into detail. What about uh, device and QTD? So this is much more difficult to do than random generation because you need experiment with a higher uh, visibility, uh, higher such set violation. So the first proof of principle experiment was done a little bit more than a year ago. So the rate is not that great, but more chromatic is the distance between Alice and Bob. So Alice was two meters away from Bob. Um, so, of course, in QTD, you want to have Alice and Bob very far from each other. Mm -hmm. But if they are very far from each other, there are losses in the channel. And so, this opens the detection pool. Okay, so this is a really big problem for device in QTD. There are ways to overcome this, for instance, using quantum repeaters, but we still do not have quantum repeaters. People are uh, trying to, to build them because they are needed anyway for even for standard QTD. Uh, but maybe, you know, you have them in 10, 20 years, you know, who knows? Okay, so not, not easy to, to implement. What about device and quantum computation? Well, we still don't have standard quantum computers, so of course we don't have uh, device development. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this device uh, approach is really nice conceptually, but it's really hard to implement uh, experimentally. And so, uh, yeah, so I'm finishing. And so this led people to uh, consider uh, self testing and device development result uh, in other correlation scenario where maybe you make some assumptions on the devices, okay? And if you make some assumption on the device, uh, then it becomes easier to certify that they work correctly and you get, get um, protocols which are easier to implement. So if you want to have uh, like full device implement with fully black box devices, you can show you need value inequalities and then you need this loop of free belt tests which are hard to do. But if you make some assumption, for instance, one assumption that people have considered is that the devices are manipulating a system in a given number of space dimension, so maybe qubits. Okay, so you don't know untrusted qubits, but qubits. Then you can show that you can have uh, self-testing and device in the statements, uh, even if you prepare a measure scenario where you don't need to generate entanglement. So this is much easier to do. And recently, computer scientists have also looked at uh, self-testing uh, using computational assumptions. This okay, so maybe you trust that the device is not solving some very hard uh, complex problem, and based on that, uh, you're able to do uh, some kind of self testing, uh, and you can do that using a single device. You see that this uh, idea 
which uh, came out from work on Benedict qualities, now it's spreading in different direction in quantum information, which is quantum this. So one last thing I didn't talk about is um, self-testing in for quantum simulators. Uh, this is something that's really hard because you know uh, you're looking at uh, many body systems um, on which you have only partial control. Typically, you can measure only few body dominators or the global scale observables. They're really noisy, and so it's really hard to um, be able to, to do this type of scale test to certify their behavior. But there are already some uh, results in the direction. So people have uh, showed how you could design very inequality, which are tailored to the devices, and uh, it was one of the first uh, to do that. Okay, so this is, well, this is basically the end of the talk. So I've been quite lazy, so I didn't put any reference uh, in the talk, but of course there are many people uh, which have contributed to these ideas. Uh, and if you want some reference, you can simply ask me or email me. So, so, so there are many people behind all this, but you know, uh, some say that soon people will be replaced by some uh, artificial intelligence. Okay, so I've been lazy again, and I ask uh, ChatGPT, you know, this uh, chatbot that, that everyone is talking about. I've asked him to write the, the conclusion of my talk. Okay, so um, I ask ChatGPT to write a conclusion for a simple talk on the subject of value qualities in classroom education. And since you are close to lunch, I said, include your Okay, and this is the answer from ChatGPT, unmodified. This is a true answer in chat read. Uh, in conclusion, I discussed the concept of bending qualities and the role of in eliminating the local nature of quantum mechanics. I also highlighted the potential for device and application, such as quantum cryptography and the of generation, which rely on the violation of bending quality, which shows the purity. Just like a theology, bending qualities may seem simple on the surface, but they reveal a complex and rich feeling when we went deeper. And just like theology, they have the potential to be enjoyed in many different ways. From the traditional, like testing the recommendation of quantum mechanics, to the more practical, such as in device and cryptography. I hope that this talk has provided a deeper understanding of the significance of value qualities in the field of quantum physics and the potential for practical applications. I look forward to further research in Sarah and I thank you for your attention. And as always, I'm open to any question and discussion on this topic. And if, if, if you excuse me, I will go and enjoy some purity now. <laughs> Uh, so thank you for the perfect positive talk and very nice uh, conclusion. Not uh, mine. Now we have time for questions. So please start. Uh, I, I like I like I like I like the road, Yes. I come from a region of Italy where they do some very similar uh, dumplings, you know, which are also sweet. So yeah. Any other okay, uh, yeah, can I can I can I go ask question? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I would like to go back to, to my previous question because I don't fully understood. So mm -hmm. with with the de device independent quantum computing, mm -hmm. since self testing uh, is only possible up to local transformations on the on this entangled pair we are testing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering okay. if mm -hmm. if this does not introduce some. Uh, some ambiguity in the end on the computation okay. itself. Maybe could you, could you right. explain this? There are kind of two ways to think about computation. Either it's you know some circuit applied to a quantum state, and the output is a quantum state, right? And then indeed, this kind of local isometries will matter. But you can also uh, consider that you know in the end, you do some measurements, and then you only uh, care about getting the, the right output, right? And then if you have some quantum circuit that gives you some outputs and you do some local change of basis, you know, the output will be the same. Okay, so what I'm considering is quantum computation in the sense that uh, I start from some classical data and I get some classical data out, mm -hmm. right? And it is that kind of um, quantum computation that can be uh, done device independently, right? Okay. So even, that, even if I um, rotate this local basis by yeah. some amount, you say that it will it will not affect this logical unitary. Yes, even if I yeah 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 if, yeah. I, if I don't know what I'm measuring in this Bell measurement in the end. You know you you you, you know what to do. Okay, but but you, you know these local so isometries they act jointly on the state and on the measurements, so so they, they cancel each other. 
in, in the um, in the probabilities, right? Okay. So the statistics you get do not depend on these localized geometries. So that's the point. Okay, so maybe we can discuss uh, maybe if you want. I said there are also questions here okay, in yes. the room. Yeah. Um, so, wait, uh, so if I understand correctly, all the tests you have presented are based one way or another on this DH. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are yeah. there any other things you could explore potentially for this type of testing? Like, um, I don't know, but I'm expecting. Using, I mean, different kind of technology. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So, so, so if it's search, you go, it's nice because uh, it's really robust uh, noise and people know it very well. And but, but you, you could indeed maybe in some application it's better to use some other input. For instance, um, in device and QTD, as I said, problem is losses. Uh, and if if you take into account loss, the best way to implement a device and QTD protocol uh, is not based on distributions inequality, but some other inequality, um, which are maximized by some other states and other measurements, which have a higher tolerance to, to, to do those. Okay, so, so indeed, uh, it, it's, it's important to, to be able to do self-testing uh, of more general uh, states uh, and, and measurements. Yes, yes. I think it's actually we're running out of time. So oh, okay, we should uh, finish. Mm -hmm. But uh, Stefano will be here, and also mm -hmm. everyone, of course, is invited to PhD defense. Mm -hmm. So let's thank you. Okay, thank you.